get into the Word of God, I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter number 8. Genesis chapter number 8. And I am um, strategically working on making sure I get you out on time. Genesis chapter number 8. As uh, Pastor Outing was talking about further faster, um, you know, we started the year with the theme further faster, not knowing what exactly that meant. And then we just started seeing God accelerate things. And so when you see these adjustments that we're making, uh, they are part of our theme further faster. And in order to go further and faster, you got to make adjustments so that you can go to that dimension. Even as a leader, if you stop growing, you stop leading. And so from preaching, Bishop John Gunn's probably one of the premier preachers of our culture. Um, I was fortunate for the opportunity now to um, sit with him every Thursday. We do these coachings on preaching every other Thursday because in order to grow as a leader, you've got to put yourself in a position to sit with others who are further than you so that they can deposit what they have so that you can become better at what you are doing. Because the leader that stops growing is the leader that feels like they've accomplished much and they don't need more to accomplish. And so like I told him, I said, I'm like LeBron James. I want to get every ring I can possibly get, right? And I want to surround myself with the proper talent to be able to do that. And so you got to sit in different rooms so that you can make sure that you're maximizing um, your effort. Genesis chapter number eight. Last week we were talking about the dove how the dove is symbolic of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit leads us. We've been in a series, if you haven't been here, about this idea about saturation, that we need the Holy Spirit to saturate us. And how does that happen? That's through prayer. That's through worship. That's through the leading of God's Spirit. And so last week, we spent a lot of time dealing with, on Genesis chapter number one, that you see that the earth was void and full of chaos, and you saw uh, the Spirit brooding on top of the water, and brooding was dealing with the word says hovering, but its original word is brooding, which is a type of dove that broods over things so that it can produce life. And we we're talking about how we need the Spirit of God to brood over our lives to produce life. And there was one part in that verse that there was a there was a flood happening in Genesis 8 to catch you up. There's a flood happening. Noah's been told that you need to build a boat because God's going to destroy the earth by water. And everybody's asking Noah, what is rain? And he says, I don't know what rain is, but God told me to build a boat. Sometimes God will ask you to build something that you don't know you need to build until it's time for it to be revealed. And there are a lot of us that God is asking us to do things that we don't understand. And God doesn't have to make it understandable right away. He makes it understandable as we go. And so a lot of us are asking God for answers up front when God is asking you for obedience up front. If you obey me up front, I'll give you more instructions on the back end than you'll get on the front end. And a lot of us want more now without doing what now is required. Because now, so like, listen, 95% of things that God has asked me to do, I've never understood why until the end of it. And so now this morning, y'all, if y'all can catch this, you'll be on fire. You'll be on top of the world. So Genesis 8, which I haven't even read yet, says that there is a dove that goes forth. And then it says that Genesis 8, 7, check it, it says, and God sends off the raven. The raven goes out. It, the raven goes out and the raven doesn't come back. The raven goes out goes and judges the earth to see if there's water, but doesn't come back. But then God switches the story and starts talking about the dove. And the dove gets all of this attention because the dove is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. But there is an interesting point that God is making, that a lot of times the things God is trying to communicate to us are in the minor details that we overlook because we're so caught up in the big details that we forget that the minor details play a very important part to the whole narrative of the story. And 
Genesis chapter 8, you're reading and you're like, well, what does a black raven got to do with saturation? Go to, go to Job chapter number 38. Job 38. Job chapter number 38. Job 38. Job 38. This is going to be interesting. Job 38 verse 41. Job 38 verse 41. Job 38 verse 41. Job 38 verse 41. So here it is. In Job 38 verse 41, y'all, it says this. Who provides, verse 40, to give you context, uh, uh, verse 41 is God talking about who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for a lack of food. Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about a lack of food? It's a question. And who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about the lack of food. For context sake, to catch you up, I love this. So for context sake, to catch you up, this is Job. Job had an argument with God saying, God, I don't know why you allowed this stuff to happen to me. And if you're saved, there's a point in your life where you start wondering, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? And if you haven't asked that question, keep living and it will come to you. You will ask yourself, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? And Job is going off. Job is like, Lord, you done tried me. I done served you. You know, we talk about Job as an upright man, but we always, we always skip over the parts because we like to romanticize biblical characters. We want them to look sexy, like they obeyed God in every aspect of their life. Job got to a point where he was like, hold up, God, I done did a lot for you. I done served you well. I done did everything you asked me to do, and this is what you're going to give me as a return on my investment of time. And Job goes on for two chapters letting God have it. And notice what God doesn't do. God doesn't interrupt him. God doesn't stop him because God is is okay with us asking him about why he's doing things because God doesn't have self-esteem issues just because you question him doesn't mean you take away from who he is now pause now here it is chapter number 38 is God's three chapter response to Job Job gives God two chapters God gives him three he says well first off let me ask you a question where were you when I created the earth where were you when I formed the stars? Where were you when I formed the seas? And then he asked him a question. Who takes care of the raven when their bird wants food? What a, what a question. Who takes care? That's a boss question. Who takes care of the raven? A bird that you and I never think about. None of us raise our children saying, uh, so what type of animal you want? Uh, I, want a, I want a raven. No, no, we, we don't even discuss ravens because they're so insignificant in the grand scheme of things. But then in Psalms, look at the psalm. Let's go to this psalm. This is, this is a good psalm to go to. And it is Psalm 147, verse 9. Psalm 147. But now notice, notice, y'all, Scripture is very detailed that we miss. You do notice that when God asked the question, he did not ask the question about who do the ravens go to? He said, who do the young ravens go to? Okay, I'm going to catch you on. He, he didn't say, who, who do the ravens go to? That changed the whole dynamic. He said, who do the young? Details. Uh, young is what? It's an, it's an adjective, right? It's an adjective is what I was taught in school. It's an adjective. It's a descriptive term. It, it's not just the ravens. I want you to know, who do the young? young. Say it with me. Who do the what? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So now, so now here it is. Now, verse, Psalm 147, Psalm 147, verse, verse number, verse, verse number nine, verse number nine, right? Okay, verse number nine. That's where we are? Okay, that's where we are. He says, he provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. Not for the old ravens, but for the what type of ravens? The young, oh, I'm weaving this together. It's going to make sense in a second. Uh, it's the, the young, not the old ravens, but the young ravens because details matter. They are very important to God that he says, I'm not just feeding anything. I'm feeding young ravens. But, but here, here, here's, here's what we're talking about this morning. So we're talking about prayer and saturation. And, and here is what many of us have discovered. Many have heard this prayer series 
and have stepped their prayer game up. But for some, they're still missing an ingredient. And they wrestle with, does God really care about my prayers? It's not that I don't believe God values prayer. It's that I question, does God value my prayers? I believe he listens to the pastor. I believe he listens to the deacon. I believe he listens to the pastor with the Jerry curl and the cross in his pocket. But does God value my prayers? And it's like the man that said to me, you know what, sometimes I wonder, God has a lot of things going on. Does he really care about my little old prayers? And if you come to God with that mindset, then you won't come to him at all. Because if you feel like you're insignificant in the purpose and the plan of God, then you don't need, like, you want to bother him. I don't want to bother you, God. You got a lot of things. There are people in Africa suffering. There are people in China that need you. You got the Dallas Cowboys that need you. And so there's all these things that are happening that you may say to yourself, I don't have a part to play with God. And God is saying, if you think that way, you will never come to me and you will never find how good of a father I am to those that come to me. Me. If Satan can keep you from coming, then you will not experience the benefits of coming. So here's what happens, y'all. If you're writing a note, here's what it says. This is an interesting thing. True prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It's far deeper than that. It's a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. Prayer is not about how loud you can be because there are some people who are loud and ain't saying nothing. It's about a spiritual transaction that you're doing with God. Do you know how powerful that is? That you, the reason why most of us will not go out to a dealership of our choice and say, I want this car is because some of us don't have the financial capacity to do that transaction. But if we had the means to do it, we will be bossing up at all the dealerships saying, give me all that black, red, white, it don't matter because I got the money to make the transaction. What God is saying is that when you pray, that is giving you the transactional ability to communicate with heaven. And most of us are saying, well, God is big. He is big, but he makes himself small when he hears you open up your mouth and you talk to him. It is a spiritual transaction. You don't need a pastor to do it for you. You don't need an elder to do it for you. God is simply saying, if you use your card, I will do it for you. If you use your card, I will make it happen for you. Don't wait on anybody else to do it. If you come to me, you are literally picking up the phone and calling heaven, and I will answer you when you call, because if I answer the little ravens that cry, how much more will I answer you? Let's go with it. So he says this, if I am willing to answer a raven that I did not make with my own hands, that I did not breathe my breath into, that I did not lay hands on, but you I made with my mind, you I made with my hand, you I made with my breath. If I will answer the call of a raven, that the only use of a raven is that it eats dead things. It's not even a bird that could be used as a sacrifice because it's an unclean black bird. It's a dirty bird. Way before the falcon said they have the dirty bird, the raven was a dirty bird. It's a bird that God looks at as insignificant. And when a raven begins to need food, and when a young raven needs food, what the raven does is it cries. It doesn't cry because it's hungry. It cries because of its instinct. When its instinct says it's hungry, it begins to cry. And when God says, who feeds the ravens, what he's saying to us is this, when ravens begin to cry and they're hungry, they are saying that I need food. They make these loud, nasty, obnoxious sounds. And if I had a raven, I would fly him in this service so y'all can see it. But since I saw how y'all did the flying preacher, I won't do it. And so here's what happens is that God says that the raven cries. And when the raven cries, it makes a loud sound. Now, why is the raven crying? I'm glad you asked. Because when the mother and father raven teach the child how to get food once, they're done with them. 
and they tell the raven, it's not like the bird that waits till you can fly and then kicks you out the nest. The mama and the daddy bird say, listen, now that we taught you how to food, we don't even want you in our territory. We don't even want you in our area. You need to go out there and fend for yourself. And so now this raven that's now an orphan because mama and daddy kicked them out has to figure out how am I going to eat. And whenever it gets hungry, it starts to cry. It starts to make this loud, annoying sound. And God says, when the raven begins to cry, nobody hears the raven, but I hear it. And when the raven begins to cry, I dispatch angels and tell the raven, angels, we got to feed the bird because the bird is hungry. I know the verse that you use. It is the verse that says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. But before that, it says, I am the God who takes care of the lilies of the field. The lilies are in the grass, they don't worry about what God is going to do for them. The flowers, they do not worry about how God's going to take care of them. And he also says, the birds of the air. Because when the raven cries, who is insignificant, not made by God, the only reason it is significant is to eat dead things. If thousand ravens die, nobody would cry, nobody would be moved. But if a thousand humans die, it would mean something. And God is saying, if I am so concerned about a bird that cannot even be used as a sacrifice, how much more am I concerned about you who have the ability to communicate with me now? Hate to break it to y'all. I know some animal rights people are going to hit me up for this. But as far as I've studied, Glover, there is no heaven for dogs, no heaven for birds. They don't have eternal souls. Okay, come, come, on, come on, church. They, they don't have eternal souls. I, I don't know about dogs trying to get themselves right with Jesus. I don't know about birds trying to make sure their lives get right with God. But God has made sure that he protects and looks after the thing that has no existence after it leaves the earth. If God is so interested in birds, how much more is he interested in the sons and daughters of God? So now, here it is. I'm closing because I'm getting better at this. So I'm closing. Here it is. Here it is. There are times where we don't like what God uses because we don't like the conduit in which it came from. See, God used the raven to feed a prophet, which is crazy because a raven is all about itself. A raven eats for itself. It don't share. But, but here, here's, here's the beautiful thing. Why... Why, I know you're thinking this, maybe not, uh, but, but, but you may be thinking, but, but God, why would you use a raven? I'm glad you asked. Because if you put a raven in the story, it means something to you. Because a raven is a blackbird that doesn't follow instructions. It left and never came back. In Genesis 8, the blackbird is insignificant, it's an unclean bird. It doesn't follow instructions. It doesn't always do what God wants it to do, but you still keep using it. Okay, y'all, y'all, I'm coming back. I'm going to pick the bus back up. The raven is an unclean bird. It, it is useless bird for many. It is a black bird that, that oftentimes is only good for dead things. God sends the bird out. It never returns, but then you find God using that same bird in 1 Kings to do his will. Okay, some of us, God has sent us out, and God gave us instruction. We didn't follow what he said, but instead of getting rid of us, the next chapter of our lives, he picks us back up again and uses us to do a great work, even though we're not qualified, even though we're not dignified. What makes us worthy of anything is who called us. It is not the fact that the bird has any significance. The bird's significance is the fact that God called the bird. Okay, well, got to go home and eat some chicken. Or for you, carrots. For the organic people. But So I have a bunch of kids in church. I have little kids, big kids, 
and then I have, well, we have, because I hate when people say I have, because like, like when people say, a mother will say, I, I have four kids. Like, no, we have four kids. Like, this is not, they're not yours, they're, they're ours. We have four kids. Or a husband say, I have five kids. No, I played a part in that process, right? Right? So anyway, so, so I didn't deliver the baby. Don't judge me. Talk to God about that. I didn't set the order of things, okay? So here, here's the thing. So I have four kids, and then I have a whole bunch of other kids that run around the church that you get to pick up, play with. Oh, you're so cute. Go back to your mama. Oh, you're so cute. Go back to your daddy. Amen. Man, they're like, oh, I want to play with Pastor. Oh, yeah, come on, kid. High five. Oh, yeah, good. Okay, go back home. Go back home. Right? But some of the kids, they see me go in the office, and they will go, Hey, can I go in there? Said, yeah, come on in. Come on. And I see another kid that walk. Can I go in there? Said, come on in. Come on in. It is, there's a fascination with what the office looks like. Then they went, kid, kid, Mama, can I go in there? Well, ask the pastor. Well, can he can he go in there? Uh, ask the pastor. Can can I go in there? Sure, come on in there. Come on in. And, they, and then they go in and then they walk out and then they feel good. I I went to the pastor's office, but my little four little children. They don't knock, and they don't ask. They just open the door because they know wherever daddy is. Because they understand wherever my father is, I have access. And some of you got to knock, but they got access. It's the same thing with your father. You don't need anybody to knock for you. You don't need anybody to go ahead of you. All you need to do is walk in because God has given you the access. And why are you praying so much? Because I got access. Why are you worshiping so much? Because I got access. I don't need permission. I don't need someone to get my approval. I can walk in. My kids can be dirty and still walk in. My kids can be nasty and still walk in because they understand that their condition doesn't stop their access because when you understand that you're a child of God you have access to the Father even if you make your bed in hell God says I'll be with you why because you have access you have access you have access you have access. I would be so broken if I saw my son asking somebody if they can go in their daddy's office. The devil is a lie. You have all the access in the world. You don't need nobody else to lay hands on you. You don't need anybody else to lead you in. You got your own access. It's time to go home, y'all. And we need access. And here's the reality. God is waiting on you to use your access. God is waiting on you to use your access. Well, pastor, I ain't perfect. Perfect. If God can use a blackbird, a raven, he can use you. You got to use your access. Stop giving your access to everybody else and start using your access. God has given you access. Access. The power is your access. Don't cry about what you can enter. As if I take care of the cries of the raven. If I take care of the cries of the raven, how much more will I hear your cry? I don't pray good, I cry good. That's good. He hears that too. He, he hears that too. He hears that too. Don't let anything talk you out of it. Because let me tell you, there's a miracle you're going to need that only your access will get you. There's a situation you're going to need that only your access is going to get you. Not nobody's prayer, not nobody's ability to communicate with God. It's your access. I done seen God do it time and time again. Maybe God has closed the door so that you can get an attitude about your access. So you can get an attitude about your boldness. Because what I found is that we like to settle and not understand that we have access. Can I give you a testimony slightly? Partially, because I, I threw you on the spot. Yeah, Nate, yeah, this this pants leg thing. Don't, no, yeah, yeah, 
Are you, you know what I'm talking about? Can I give you? You can't hear me. Okay. Uh, Father, let hearing happen in Jesus' name. Can I give you a testimony about the pants? Okay. So, so we're talking about access, right? So, so there are miracles we all, we all going to need for ourselves because we have access. We have access. We have access. There are some that have been believing for children, and they've been asking, Pastor, pray that I can have children. And I will pray, and I, and I do believe in that. But I, I think there's something better that when you pray, God has a, a quicker time to respond to you when you pray. And, and let, me, let me help you. Maybe, maybe you may be in that season. You may be saying, well, I pray to God, and it doesn't seem like God, God answered me. Just because God doesn't answer your, in your favor doesn't mean that God did not answer you. There are things that God does not do we will not understand on this side of glory. That's why I don't want to hype you into things like next year is going to be your year. Well, first off, if you're living your best life, so we're going to talk about that another time. So so here, here here's, a, here's a reality. So so next year shouldn't be your year if you're living the best life already. Okay, so so here's the thing. Bravis was, was dealing with, with scar tissue that would make um, his legs uh, inflate there, and 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 I and I after a while I said, Bravis, you know you you a young man, you know this this is this is not what God wants for you. He's like, yeah, man, but you know it's been like this for a while, and you could see that sometimes when things have been such a way for a long time, you just stop hoping. You start. You could sing about God's goodness and God's bigness, and in your heart, you're like, "Yeah, He is big, but I don't know if He's big for me." Everybody goes through that season where you just wonder, "I know He's able, but is He able for me? I know He's capable, but is He capable for me? I know He's powerful, but is He powerful for me?" And one day, I just got, you know, you, you got to be kind of crazy to say something like this to somebody, because if you say it and they take it the wrong way, they. they you you just, you just lost them. But if you feel it by the spirit, I said, you know what? Here's what I'm going to tell you. I said, you need to go to a doctor and find the right doctor because there is a doctor that can find the heartbeat of God for your situation. And he said, well, I've been looking and, and doctors have this. And I said, okay, well, you do me this favor. You stop singing about how big God is until you believe it for yourself. Because even when I don't believe, I've got to make myself find a testimony somewhere to where I can believe. And he sent me a mail. He said, Pastor, I want to send you a picture, but I'm not going to send you a picture because you know how that is in life. You send people pictures, then they, somebody grab your phone about, oh, the praise and worship leader sent the pastor pictures of his legs. We don't know what's going on with that. Right? So, so, so he sent me a picture. He said, Pastor, I can wear skinny jeans now. Because my leg used to be one thing. It's shrunk down. Why? Because you got to learn how not to just sit and accept this as this is how it's going to be. The devil is alive. I'm not going to die like this. I'm not going to end like this. Now he's wearing his Chelsea boots, skinny jeans. Why? Running after his kids. Because if I'm going to sing about God being big, I've got to believe him to be big. And I've got to use the access that God has given unto me. young man believing for a child and we'll go together and he'll be talking about man I just I don't go to church during Mother's Day Father's Day and I get it I wouldn't go either I don't want to be nobody's god dad because I want my own and pastor I want you to pray that I have a child and I'm like yeah man I'm praying but I think this may be something spiritual that you will start doing on your own that maybe God will use this closed season to get you underneath an open heaven to where you can start believing that prayer works. Because it's one thing if I tell you my testimony, but it's another thing if I see your testimony. And, 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 and for years, they were married, and, and for years they've been believing God for a child, and now they're at the stage where they're having a baby. They're, they're having their own child. And to see his wife walk with her belly out and to know the struggle, to know the tears, to know that just because God doesn't hear you the first time doesn't mean you stop asking. Just because God doesn't hear you the second time doesn't mean you stop asking. You got to, I'm just crazy enough to believe that if God has your name on it, what is for you, 
will manifest if you don't give up, if you keep believing. Now Father's Day, he's texting us talking about, I'm soon to be a father, y'all. I'm just praying the baby don't look like him. We're going to be a father, y'all. God's going to do it for me. Why? Because when you have a miracle for yourself, you don't need anybody else to tell you about God. There's not a devil, there's not a textbook that can talk me out of believing God. Because when I needed this child, God gave me my heart's desire. And I know, because I've been preaching a while, that there's somebody that's in this place and you're like, man, listen, I, I, Pastor, I, you had me for a moment and you lost me. Because I've been believing God for something and it failed and it didn't work out the way I thought. Welcome to the club. We all have things that we've been believing God for, and they did not happen the way that we thought they were going to happen. But the good thing that I've looked at is that I've survived some things that other people have died under. I've walked through some things, kept my joy in those things that other people have given up on. And I know it wasn't me keeping myself. It was God keeping me. And my testimony isn't about what I lost. It's about God's ability to keep me in the midst of it. It's about God's ability to hold me up when I couldn't hold myself up and I will lose things in life that's a part of the process of life I will lose things that I love but one thing that I hope I never lose is the God that keeps me together it's the God that keeps me when everything is falling apart so listen I don't know what you've been believing for I don't know what's been stopping you from praying. But don't let it keep you out the presence. Because you have access. You have access. There, there's no strategy you can come up with for us that's going to make you successful. It's, it's those that don't pray, they just won't cut it. There's too much pressure not to pray. Too much decisions to make not to pray. If you're raising kids, God knows. You got to pray. Let me give you this last quote. We'll write it down and we're done. And ushers are getting in position. To be a Christian without prayer, by, this is by Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King. Martin Luther, the church reformer. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. If you make decisions without praying, you'll be in trouble. Proverbs 3, 5, lean not unto your own understanding. All your ways. Acknowledge him. He shall. He shall. Proverbs 3 5. Lean not unto your own understanding. Lean not unto your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he shall direct your path. Proverbs 3 5. Lean not unto your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. If I take care of the lilies of the field, the grass has no comprehension of how tomorrow is going to keep it. And if I take care of the young ravens, how much more will God look after you? Bow your heads, let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful that you give us reminding words to reassure us that you want to hear from us. We have access.